So in practicing dermatology, it becomes very clear early on that the severity of most of our skin diseases is really not easy to assess or easy to communicate. Almost none of the conditions that we treat can be followed by labs and the patients that we take care of, fortunately, survive instead of dying from their diseases. And we also quickly learned that the visible extent of disease, what we actually see on the skin, often doesn't correlate to how much a patient is disturbed or distressed. And patients with minimal clinical involvement, so not a lot on the skin, may be really distressed, but others with more extensive involvement may not be bothered by it. So the severity of a skin disease is actually related to both its clinical extent, but also its effects on patients' quality of life. So when we talk about quality of life from a scientific point of view, the question is, what do these words and terminologies actually mean? And there's a lot of variability in the terms that are used in this realm. We talk first about health status. And that's pretty self-explanatory, just your current state of health. Similar to that is functional status, so your ability to do your normal activities. And then health-related quality of life, which is what we'll be talking about today and what we tend to study the most, includes health status, but it goes further by including the value that patients attach to their health status. How does it impact them and what does it mean to them? It's our patient's satisfaction with life in the domains that they consider to be important. And unsurprisingly, we found that CTCL has a really profound and pervasive impact on patients' quality of life for various reasons. And the goal for us when we are treating CTCL is generally palliation, making people feel better, not always curing the disease. So quality of life is one of the most important factors to us to consider when we're making our therapeutic decisions. So it makes sense why we as doctors care about quality of life in a clinical setting, because we care about our patients. But the question becomes, why do we have to think about it in such a scientific way? Why do we need all of these structured studies about it? And really, this does go beyond just us wanting to improve outcomes for our patients. It's actually something that the FDA now requires as part of clinical studies. And it's something that they look at very carefully when they're thinking about approving a new medication. There is more and more of this emphasis on patient experience with a drug rather than just the traditional study endpoints that we used to think about, like just how long you survive without thinking about what your quality of life is like during that time. So some conclusions, obviously patients' concern about their appearance is something that sets CTCL apart from other cancers and other chronic conditions. Our patients feel isolated, their sleep is dramatically affected, and even though the MFSS does ask about the severity of symptoms, those symptoms affect patients in different ways. And so we feel that it's important to address those different symptoms individually so we can fully capture all of these additional factors that patients feel are important to them and to their lives. So we have this information, we're seeing again, how poorly our patients are doing. So I talked about earlier, the fact that CTCL is a cancer and an inflammatory skin disease. It's not just one thing, but using multiple questionnaires like the survey packet that we use is really time consuming. And it's really burdensome for patients to have to do that every time they come into the clinic. So the take home point here is that we as a CTCL community that advocates for our patients with CTCL should be developing and using a more specific quality of life tool to measure what our patients actually think is important. And our study highlighted those specific symptoms that we talked about, specific aspects of quality of life 
that current instruments don't measure. What we need is a single disease specific patient reported quality of life measure that we can use in clinic for all of our patients to assess our patient's quality of life at a moment in time. But then we can also look at the impact of treatment on quality of life over time. And eventually we hope that that can help guide us on the treatments that would work best, not just for skin and blood clearance, but also for improving quality of life for different types of patients. What words of wisdom would you give us to improve our quality of life? Moisturize your skin would be my first, my first statement. Yeah, I definitely think that uh, skincare is really important and I, it's something that's hard. And I think that often patients kind of uh, have difficulty with it because it's something that requires a lot of discipline. Like taking a pill is very fast, whereas putting a cream on your body takes a lot of work. But I think that people who actually uh, do it every day do experience a ton of benefit from it. I think people often underestimate the amount of benefit that people can have from a steroid cream because it's a cream, so it doesn't feel like it would do a lot, but it actually does really help um, kind of maintain your skin and improve your skin if you're able to do it. So, um, so research studies have found that despite the symptom burden, patients have developed coping strategies. And these strategies include becoming well-informed about cutaneous T-cell lymphomas, drawing on social support, and maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Also studies that follow patients that had depression and anxiety over time, they observed that after their baseline, within three months, patients had decrease of anxiety and depression. But these patients had some specific interventions. The first one was treatment. Treating the disease will decrease anxiety and depression. But also patients that follow a psychological programs or patients that are part of a social or network group where the patients feel that their needs were monitored and used to help them cope with management of their illness, show that the anxiety and depression was decreased after three months. But not all stress is harmful. The body responds similarly to all the types of stress. The, the body releases stress hormones, epinephrine and cortisol. So epinephrine is responsible for increasing your blood pressure, speeding your heart rate, and boosting your energy supplies. Cortisol will raise your blood sugar levels, but enhance also the brain ability to use that sugar and increase the avail availability of proteins to repair tissue. All of these functions of the body during stress are aimed to survival. And this helps a person to act with strength and speed during acute stress. And this is straight helps during acute situations such as exams, jobs interview, to keep people focused and motivated. But what happens when this stress is chronic? When we're having these hormones released over time, uh, affecting our body, putting in these stress states during a long time. So coping with chronic stress can be challenging. It results of overexposure of cortisol and other stress hormones, and it can harm your health. And it can cause several uh, problems, including, including anger or irritability, sadness, can affect your stomach and cause digestive problems. Some people get headaches when they're stressed. Other people get some sleep problems. Uh, weight gain is also a side effect from stress. It can affect memory and concentration. And it can also affect your immune system. It can weaken your immune system. So it is, it's been studied what happens with people that attempt to manage their stress with risky behaviors, such as smoking or drinking, or who become more sedentary with our face with stress. And these people usually have poorer quality of life, 
that do not, that than the ones that do not engage on such behaviors. In contrast, people who use effective coping strategies, such as relaxation and stress management techniques, they have been shown to have lower levels of anxiety, lower levels of depression, and even symptoms related to their cancer. That's why it is so important to learn healthy ways to cope with your life stressors. So now we're going to talk about stress management strategies. So number one, be observant. It is important to recognize your own signs of stress or the signs of stress in your loved ones. Some people respond to stress by having difficulty sleeping. Insomnia is a common sign of stress. Others may have an increased alcohol and other substance use. Being easily angered, feeling sad or depressed, feeling fatigue, having low energy levels are signs of stress. But stress presents differently on each person, so it's very important to be observant. Talk to a professional. Don't wait for your healthcare provider to ask you about stress. So some ideas that uh, a few of my patients already follow, they prepare for their visit. So write down your questions, but also write down if you're feeling stress. I think in your list of questions, you can add like a question about stress, about management of stress, or if you want to talk uh, with a professional about it. Sometimes it's good to be, bring a friend or a relative, not only for the emotional support, but also because sometimes these visits can be overwhelming. So they will help you remember <laughs> what you were thinking of asking when you are there. And be honest, we are here to help you. So we want to know how you're doing, what's going on, uh, what can we do to make this the best outcome for you. There are studies that have shown that moderate to severe, to severe stress, um, if you have one of those um, type of stress, you will be referred to uh, an appropriate resource, such as a health clinical psychologist, a social worker, chaplain, or psychiatrist. Most cancer centers have all of those.